Also, a warm welcome from, from my side. I've been working as a lead system architect in the area of ground transportation of Thales since a lot of years. So ground transportation, as already mentioned, means in this context that we provide systems for safe, reliable, and secure operation of railway systems. Thales provides here solutions from field elements like signals mounted along the railway track up to complex railway management systems. And I was, as also already mentioned, involved in a lot of bits and projects. And I wanted to show now here in this presentation, the transfer from a simple model indicated not by, by using not all of the layers of Arcadia here in this model to a more complex and the now running real work project. So this figure here is not an abstract drawing of a modern artist, it shall show just the way from a simple, very pragmatic model designed during a bit phase to help everybody there to get to a common understanding what we need to deliver there, to a more complex model that describes and the needs and the stakeholders and the project. So the stakeholders are very different one, where here the bit team was the main stakeholder so there are only logical and physical architecture were in the main focus. We have now a lot of more stakeholders. We have the customer there, we have specialist engineers, and we have software architects there. So this model got more and more complex. And it was the first time we tried to move this, to, to get this move from here, from the simple bit model to the complex model there. And there are not so easy ways. We struggled with some, some topics and there were also a lot of questions there which need to be answered during this transfer from here to there. So, for example, what shall we do with the more than 3,000 customer requirements we have in a text form here? How shall we bring them in here? Which Arcadia levels from operational analysis, system analysis, logical architecture or physical architecture shall we select for, for select for which purpose in the project. So what I want to present to you now is exactly how this has been supported by Capella, this long way from the simple bit project to our complex real world project. So let's go to the next slide. This is an overview about the presentation in, uh, I would say, in a more graphical form. And this presentation is structured in three main sections. We will start with an introduction that is a simple introduction into our business and the specific project we are looking to give everybody an impression of what we're really talking about here um, in this project, what we have to deliver finally. We will then do a retrospective in the second step of the bit model. As already mentioned, I presented this in a, in a longer pr presentation in the Capella days 2018, so three years ago. Maybe some of you will remember it there. But we will have also a closer look at what I presented there during this phase so that we all get to the same level of knowledge here. I will not complete the, the, the I will not uh, make the same presentation again, just the essence of the, the work. But I want to refer to the old slides a little bit, because then especially the main step, the next one to the project model, this is a really important one, because this is exactly the most difficult steps. We had to answer questions like, what can be reused from the simple bit model with the focus, which had the focus only to support the bit team, now to a project model that has much more stakeholders to, to support. What to need to be developed newly in this model? What do we have to do there um, using uh, to support uh, other stakeholders like the customer, like the developers, and also specialists for safety or security aspects? And we have to clarify, as I already mentioned, what shall we do with a lot of textual requirements? So this is a whole bunch of, of questions 
that results finally in a model that was refined in the last three years. And we will have also a closer look at the structure of the model here to see what we used from Arcadia and Capella and what not. But finally, we will also look at the challenges we had and we needed to solve. And final, and last but not least, we will end up, with, uh, end up with some final conclusions that may help also you to support you in such a transition situation or if you're starting such a great bit in order to be successful at the end. So then let's jump into the model or into the presentation. And we start with the introduction. I mentioned already in the beginning that Thales provides systems for railway traffic management in an area or in a whole country. So we will see in this introduction first railway traffic management systems, often abbreviated as TMS for traffic management system. What is this really? What does a TMS do? And uh, why does the customer want who provides railway operation want something like this? And we will finally have also a short look at the specific topics in the TMS Norway project. So TMS, what is it? So this reminds me a little bit of a famous old German video, uh, film there where a teacher tries to explain to his students a steam engine. Maybe some of the German participant knows this film very well too. But the, the left side of this figure, just to show it here, yeah, this is for many European railway operators. Uh, um, it is a, a so-called interlocking, uh, a system that prevents uh, and allows uh, unconflicting train runs outside. This mechanical interlocking is coming out of the steam age there. So for many European railway operators, this is not only historic equipment out of a museum, but this is reality in daily business. So not only one European railway operator, for example, in Germany or in the UK, has such mechanical interlockings running with an age of more, hundred years, of more than 100 years in operation. And even if there are newer relay technologies, also this technology has an age of 50 or 60 years in use. So railway operating companies in all over the Europe are faced with the situation that currently travelers, society and politicians want to run more and more trains on such a railway network. So what they need are two things. They need to renew on one hand, their infrastructure, like this old interlocking system there. But on the other hand, not only do a renewal on a local base, but they need to act more on a global base, like seen here on the right picture, on the right side. They need solutions that optimize the rail traffic over the whole country not in small areas only, but in wider areas, and especially for a lot of countries in the whole country. And here's the situation where TMS comes into the play. So we want first to have a look there. What are those objectives the customers need during the, the situation that they need to control it much more, more globally? and. Uh, so we start there. We had already the term global optimization, but what needs to be globally optimized here really? So railway business works normally that there is a timetable, time schedules that determine daily train operation. So a specific train is running every day at the same time. And those timetables are normally constructed perfectly. So there's no conflict in such a timetable. All these trains are planned perfectly. And will, if they would run in time, everything would be okay. So nobody would need a TMS system. But this is not reality that every time is, every train is always in time. If we traveling ourselves, we know that this is not the case. We have trains which are delayed, which are resulting in delays for other trains and so on. So what the TMS shall provide here is to look at the situation and to provide support to the railway operation companies to find 
a global optimized solution in such critical situation where we have delays for the train. So what shall the operators do? Which train shall be stopped? Uh, which shall, train shall be passed to have finally the lowest delay for all trains, to have the lowest energy consumptions and all such things for other performance indicators. So what TMS shall provide is the support to find globally optimized solutions in conflicting situations of railway operations. But this is only one pole of the, the uh, one thing that uh, a TMS shall provide. On the other end of the scale, our um, um, companies, railway operating companies, want uh, to have a TMS that can help more, that can provide also local operation of signaling systems. For example, like track workers as shown in this figure here, which work along the track, TMS shall provide a local operation, for example, by mobile devices, also by smartphones or mobile phones to enhance their safety so that the workers can see which trains are passing on their sections and help them to protect themselves against unintended movements there. So TMS shall cover this wide range from global optimized rail traffic in a local country, in a whole country, up to the local operation of signaling systems. So it has to find the optimized train schedules, support the dispatchers in doing this optimization, operate automatically the train movement and the signaling systems to release dispatchers from the routine jobs and to allow also this local operation. So it's a huge bandwidth of functionality the TMS has to provide. In Norway, we have the specific situation that the customer there wants to renew the whole network and wants to have a TMS for this network. The network there has an amount of about 4,000 kilometers of railway network and TMS shall finally control the traffic in the whole country using three different control centers and um, exactly with those objectives from the global to local operation as we saw on the slide before. A few specific challenges which exactly is especially exact <laughs> exist for this customer in Norway here are those things here. We have a very heterogeneous traffic in this country compared to Germany or to France or to the UK. It's very different. You have in the north here, for example, in Trondheim, only about 60 trains per day, but in the high density area here around the capital in Oslo, you have about 1000 trains per day. And we have also technical challenges. We have to finally adapt to the new European so-called ERTMS or ETCS standardized signaling and control system here. But in the meantime, until this system is installed in the whole country, we have to adapt also to existing legacy systems um, in the meantime to, to allow a TMS to be in work already before this whole rollout has been done. So, yeah, for this purpose, we did the bit some years ago. And uh, this are now a few slides where I want to present you a little bit about the problems we had in, in the bit. And we want to see also and have to have a look at how we try to solve some of these problems with the Capella um, architecture. This is based on my presentation from a few years ago, but don't be afraid, I won't repeat it. If you are interested in more than this, just search for it on the internet uh, regarding the Capella Day 2008, and there you will find the, the presentation. Just a summary of this topics or these problems uh, on, on just two slides here. The first one is looking about the problems. Typical problems are mainly issued or uh, are existing due to the situation that bit teams are very heterogeneous. You have commercial guys, technicians, and also lawyers, which need to work together here. Everybody has normally surely his favorite tools. And everybody has also a specific language 
she or he uses in this context. I think most of you will know the situation. You see here on the right side a slide from my previous presentation with some examples. You have figures with very different layouts, very different figures. You have different colors, different names, different representations there on a more syntactical form. But you have also mixed and semantical areas where logical and physical views are often mixed, technical or sales views are mixed. And you see this typically in these figures here. The result of this, this approach is often a misunderstanding that will be detected lately in the bit process and lead to much rework. And it also leads to poor presentations in big documents. For example, not in this project, but in other projects. A few years ago, I heard a customer saying, oh, this system looks like as it has been put together by three different garage companies. So the so typical situation this is surely not representative, but this is many some a bunch of good examples where some of you may already know from your your own experience. So this process of problems and bits, there was a question already a few years ago: How could Capella help here? So the idea was to use Capella as a tool to overcome the most critical topics there. So the first step we said, OK, we use logical and physical architecture of Capella to have separate views um, to avoid misunderstandings and especially to avoid and to identify missing topics and to have the logical and the physical architecture to have a common view on the system and have unique figures like this one for the logical or this one for the physical architecture that are used over, all over the whole bit documentation. We did additionally already a very partial functional allocation to identify some critical scenarios and they have been also used already in customer documentation. Challenges was clear. This is an effort for introduction, not only for the guys which uh, need to, to do these models, but also for the whole BIT team, which need to learn to read these models. I don't know how often I have been asked in the or I've been explaining in this time, what, for example, the difference between an actor and a component in the Capella model is due to the light blue versus dark blue coloring there. So not training is not only needed for model creators, but also for readers. So this challenge should not be underestimated. And it should also be clear that there will um, some hindrings because it's a new tool and nobody wants this, this at the end. But surely this is not bit, bit specific. This happens also in a lot of other projects. But um, it finally, we decided there, this is a good way to, to go on. And yeah, the result was, we won the bit finally, and now the question was, how shall we continue? We were happy there, but we have now a lot of questions what we should do and how we can continue here. How can we proceed? Shall we proceed with the bit model? Shall we make something new? How shall we describe the so-called technical and operational scenarios the customer wants to see for us now? So therefore, we are introducing a new um, stakeholder like the customer in this context. How to introduce special aspects like safety aspects. And we will have in the second section uh, or third section of, of, the, of my presentation, finally a look at the challenges before we then, before then I will finish the, the presentation. So the first question was the topic, what to do with the BIT model? Remember that we had during the bit phase presented, prepared a logical architecture and a physical architecture view of Acaridia and Capella. So the first question was, shall we reuse both levels? Shall we reuse either the LA or the logical architecture or the physical architecture level? Or shall we reuse nothing? Our final decision was that we reuse the physical architecture, but re-implement the logical architecture. The question is now, why is this case? 
So the, the background was that the physical architecture, mainly the view of the hardware equipment, is defined mostly by the structure of the locations provided by the customer. And there was no big change between big and project. So it was easy for us to reuse our existing physical architecture. But why was then the logical architecture re-implemented in Capella? One topic is that we learned from other projects. It is for software architects, which are also one of the stakeholders now in the real life project. It's much more easier for them to read the models if the logical architecture, even if logical architecture is not a software architecture, but only a logical view, is quite similar to the structure they have finally in their software architecture. So it is always a good idea to have at least the top level structure as shown here on the right side, very similar to the high level software architecture. And not only on PA, also already on logical architecture because there something changed in our approach between the bit phase where the software architecture was only defined on a very rough level to the real world project. It was a good idea to redo also the Capella model here. This helped for mainly the software architects because we developed it together with them. Uh, very good to understand the problem. The problem here from our point of view is that TMS is very new in a lot of aspects in this new software system here. So software architects often need a, already in an early stage, a more detailed component structure. So we put this into the Capella model. So you see here three or four levels of, of logical architecture components. This helped the software guys to get to a common view, but this was also a problem. Sometimes the uh, Capella architecture is too detailed from my point of view here. The second aspect we tried to reuse from the, the bit model was the aspect to have functions and functional change there. We used them on the logical architecture level already in the bit, but we extended them here a lot of things. And we have mainly the focus on this critical scenario. So he has written safety. For example, we try to describe the safety critical processes in the systems. We see later on a picture for this purpose again. We try <clears throat> to describe the handling of alarms and diagnosis message. And we also use these um, logical architecture level to create interface specifications. We used mainly logical architecture diagrams, but we extended them by sequence diagrams when necessary, in particular to describe specific failure cases. From our point of view, this is a small note. We experienced that function, that logical architecture diagrams with functional change, chains are very good readable by customer and system architects but that often software architects much more like the same, uh, same flow, but displayed as a sequence diagram, which is often much more and better understandable for software architects. So we did some figures twice, one time as um, a logical architecture diagram with a functional chain and one time as a sequence diagram. So in the result, we have a common view for the system architects, the software architects, the specialists also, for example, for the safety guys. One problem what we had in this context, I already mentioned this before, is how do we handle the huge amount of customer requirements in this context? So this is about 3000 requirements in a different DOS modules. So our first idea was to say, okay, for each of this requirement, we create a function in the Capella model that reflects those requirements, link them, for example, via the requirements viewpoint together, and do then the functional allocation of these functions on logical architecture. This would be a very good and very nice way, but the problem was that the effort due to the real high amount of about 3,000 requirements is much too high. So it was there for us, uh, also a problem to find the right level of allocation. I already mentioned that we have several levels on logical architecture and to say, okay, where is the best place to do allocation here? This is not always easy to find because if we do it as usual on the lowest level, 
3,000 requirements would be, from my point of view, or 3,000 functions would not be enough. You would need even more, and this was not handable. So we make a decision that we do only a very loose coupling by coupling by assigning the logical architecture components to requirements indoors by using the same name. This is very, very rough only, but it was feasible. And it was also a lot of drawbacks because also the problem of finding the right level here between software and system architecture remains. Yeah, just the next topic we had. I already mentioned that the customer is also a stakeholder for the model now, but you may ask why. The reason is that the customer has a requirement that he wants to see such called technical operational scenarios where you, so we as a provider, describe how we implement technically the operational scenarios which the customer has defined in textual form now in our system. So our first decision was we use Capella for this purpose. And then the question was, which level or which view of Capella do we use? Shall we use system analysis or shall we use operational analysis? It was clear from the bit phase because the customer liked such diagrams that we use such a swim lane form. But it was the question if we should better use OA or operational analysis or system analysis view. The advantage for the system analysis would be that the customer had already a clear view what the system already is, including the borders. And it would be easier to transfer all the things to logical architecture level. But on the other hand, the operational architecture had one advantage. Sometimes, not often, the customer wants to have a closer look inside the TMS and describes, I would say, more freely as it is possible on the strict system analysis level where you have only the structure, system, and actors. Uh, you, to describe this with different operational entities on the um, operational analysis level more easier. So it's also not so closely coupled to the logical architecture and physical architecture view. So we were capable to, capable to reflect different things in different views. So we ended up with the operational analysis using it. In the swim lane form, we assign here to these different operational entities or operational actors, the operational activities, and show the processes and the flows, so what the customer wants to see as operational processes here. This worked quite good, even if up to 10 people worked together using Capella for Teams. Surely not all 10 people worked all, all the same time, but a few of them were at one point in time surely working parallel. And this worked quite good from our experience. Our most important result is finally that the customer approved this approach. He liked it and it helped uh, to get really a good and common agreement between the customer and the system architects. So this was one extension, one big extension of our model in the real world compared to the bit phase. The last extension we want to look at are special aspects, like the safety aspects. What means safety here in the context of railways? So safety means, so as is defined in the European standard, freedom from an unacceptable risk, related, for example, to human health or something. So safety needs a more detailed description of the dynamic system behavior, as seen here below, to show how we mitigate, by which measures, by which functions, those risks that they are low enough to be accepted later on. So we used logical architecture diagrams, again, to show here detailed flows with functions, functional change and chains, and mainly we show the regular flow here. We used also sequence diagrams to detail sequences and to show failure scenarios. And what is also good, we could identify by coloring the different functions here differently, exactly those functions which are safety related and not. So it helped a lot in the discussions with software, with software architects, and also in the, with the safety engineers to get um, a good understanding of the safety related flows and this, this whole context. So now, 
we reach nearly the end of the third and last part of my presentation, and we are coming now closer to the end of the presentation. I tried on this slide here to summarize a little bit the challenges, or you could also say sometimes the recommendations resulting from those challenges on this one slide. One topic we already touched a little bit is the topic of the, the modeling guideline. This is surely needed if 10 people worked or more at working together on such a project. What we learned and what is really important there is that the modeling rules define the principles and do it in not a too strict way. If you try to define each and every detail, users often don't find what they are looking for in the guideline because it's too big or they feel hindered by the guideline. So our experience is a little bit that users need a little bit of freedom, but not too much. And the important thing is also, you need to rethink about the modeling rules and to readjust the guideline if needed. One big problem or one big step problem for us, which we could not solve really completely, is the cultural change from documents and requirements-based engineering to model-based system engineering. I would try in my next project to bring in more functions related to functional requirements in the model and to find a good balance between requirements and, um, and functions here, but this is not so easy. So this is a problem that also depends on the huge number of detailed requirements we get from our customer. So I was really happy to read that my colleague, Peter Havenga and Laura Mellon will present their experience in such cases tomorrow here. Therefore, I'm very curious about their presentation tomorrow afternoon. So this is one topic which we could not solve 100%. So we should this discuss and follow up this, this topic in future there too. But the last topic where we see a lot of challenges is the transition from system to software engineering. So we have slightly different languages. Software engineers speak normally UML and there some things are not 100% exactly the same. So we need a little bit of translation there. We are focusing often the discussion about the different approaches in, um, in Capella or in UML tool. For example, the question about objects and instances. This would be a topic for a whole own presentation. And I will not go through each and every detail what Capella can provide here or not. But the standard, how Capella works here, works quite good and well for system engineers. But often software architects do not understand that, we, that Capella does not differentiate between ob objects and instances. And last but not least, this is also a problem. We have different tools here. Software architects normally use other tools than, than Capella there. So we need to synchronize it. It was a compromise that we just lost, no, used finally just the same naming, like we did it for the synchronization also with, with, with stars. Just note that most of the challenges are not really depending only on the step from bit to project, but most of them would also occur if no bit model would have existence. Often, but it's not easy to decide like you see here on this figure, if you should turn left or should turn right. But I would recommend it then recommend that you should decide, go one way, even if it's finally not the better one, but it's better than just to stop here and to say, oh no, we cannot use MBSE for such, such things. So yeah, I would say we are nearly finished now with my presentation. You see here on the last slide, it looks very applicable, an applicable approach to reuse also parts from the MBSE model from the bit phase. We ended up finally with an extensible architecture. And what we should not forget, because a lot of people, a lot of colleagues worked here in this project, we have now a lot of more experienced architects, which were familiar with model-based system engineering and also with Arcadia and Capella as a method and a tool. So I'm now finished with my presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I think I'm open for questions. OK, let's start with the first one. You said you had over 3,000 
textual requirements? How many model elements did you end up with? Oh, this is a good question. I don't know the exact number, but it's, um, I would expect the, the whole model over all the uh, operational, logical, and physical architecture views we, we, we used, and the small amount on system architecture will be half thousand or more elements on the between thousand and two thousand. I didn't count it, but I will try to get the number. It, it interests myself to, me myself too. Yeah, but I would say okay. it's the same order of magnitude as the the requirements. Thanks. Uh, second question: uh, Have you tried to quantify safety by exploiting the information included in the model plus the wraps? Uh, optional mm -hmm. reliability data added by the user. Yeah, ex exactly. One of the, the, the topics what we um, we thought about, but we didn't have the time to do this, to to um, use it for reliability and safety analysis. We know that there are tools like um, all for tech safety architects with where you can transfer model data also to a fault tree or to an FMEA analysis. Uh, but we just started to do this with this. We thought about it, but we didn't implement it in the project. So the time was a little bit too short. Have you tried exploiting the Capella model or bridging with another modeling tool to generate software from the model? Yeah, to auto generate software, not, but we tried once the bridge to and Sparks Enterprise Architect to bring the high level component architecture from Capella to there. It worked, but this was just the beginning there and the starting point there. So we tried, but this was not used really in production, I would say. To what extent 10 people working on the project were trained or accustomed? Oh, ah, well, <laughs> the question was lost. Uh, I can read it, yeah. others, okay. <laughs> To what extent can people working on the project were trained and accustomed to Capella? This was very different. There were a few guys we were really newbies and beginners, uh, but there were a few guys, but not much, I would say two or three, which had experience in the Capella and Acadia. But most of them need to learn it and to use the tool. You mentioned the need for modeling rules in large mm -hmm. projects. Uh, what do these rules look like and how do they differ from what is specified uh, by the Arcadia method or by uh, yeah, particular it, books? It's, not, it's just the rule or helps that Arcadia and Capella provide a lot of possibilities to express similar things. For example, to show dynamic processes as a sequence diagram or as a functional chain. And the modeling rules just define what to use in which case for example to say okay principally we use the diagrams uh, using the functional chains and structure it in this way and only in this critical situation where we need for example timeliness aspects or show several variants in one diagram we use then a sequence diagram so it, it, it's a hint for a user to select the specific methods from the um, from the Capella and Acadia toolbox there. And on the other hand, this is the second part, it's just the layouting game, how that we show always that different people show it in a, in a similar way. 